Everyone, welcome to this episode of Get Your Marriage On. Today, my guest is Dr. Jennifer finlayson Fife. She's a relationship and sexuality educator and coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor working in, um, ah, I'm going to start over. Sure. <laughs> Everyone, welcome to this edition of the Sexpert interview series through Get Your Marriage On. I'm really honored to have my guest today, Dr. Jennifer finlayson Fife. If you don't know her, she's a relationship and sexuality educator and coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor. She works primarily with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is our faith tradition, but her teachings and her style and her message has blessed many couples all over the world. She has a PhD in counseling and clinical psychology from Boston College. My wife and I have taken her online courses. I've been in her latest men's group and she is really smart, probably an IQ of 180 or 90, <laughs> and you're going to learn a lot from this, and I'm really looking forward to having you on today. Thanks for having me. Thanks. I wanted to ask, like, a lot of us grew up in, in homes uh, where, like, what are, we don't have a really good model or really good picture and idea of what really good sex or love life looks like when we go into our own marriages. That's something I've learned a lot from you in your courses. You really paint a beautiful picture of what a really rich love life can look like. Can you talk on a few of those things? Sure. It's, it's a big question because it's, um, it's a little bit hard, I think, to put into words. But when I think sex is at its best, it is a form of... Um, intimacy in the sense of about knowing and being known and it's you know because there's something wholehearted and whole body about it that it can feel like a kind of blessed um, space to really be with your spouse um, I think that you know, our sexuality is a particular way of knowing and it allows us to kind of see and experience beauty in life, or at least potentially um, to experience beauty in life through that sort of intimate ritual that is kind of a marital sacrament. I mean, I, I sound super lofty. You did start with a lofty question, so <laughs> we can make it a little more real, but, you know, it is a kind of... Um, marital sacrament, I think, uh, not devoid of lots of pleasure and sensuality. So I don't mean so cleaned up. In fact, it's kind of the fact that it's a place to play and for it to not be so cleaned up in a way that makes it so special and unique. Gotcha. People confuse intimacy and sex all the time. Yes. Definitely. Let's, why, why is that? Yeah, well, first of all, it's a euphemistic word and everybody likes the euphemistic words and intimacy sounds nice. And, but we definitely um, do that problematically because a lot of people have sex in ways that, it, that are not intimate. In fact, they're kind of getting through the act of sex and actually managing how much of themselves is showing up or how knowable they in fact are, or how much of their mind they actually share. So a lot of couples are actually managing and limiting the intimacy. You know, it sort of surprised me in the beginning of the work that I did. Sometimes I'm working with couples that would talk about actually feeling deeply lonely after sex and because of what wasn't happening there, because of the desire that wasn't real, that it was accommodating or, you know, mercy sex, but not really based in a desire and a passion and the kind of pain, you know, on the one hand, when I'd say sex can be such a source of beauty and, um, and intimacy, it can also be a real source of pain and destructiveness as well. It's a very powerful language uh, in which to engage another human being. And so it's never one thing, but it can be a remarkably beautiful thing. That's great. You can join two bodies, but that's not all it's it's the heart that goes into it i guess is what you're saying yeah exactly the heart and the mind and and how much you really exactly how much love 
is a part of the connection, how much it's about um, receiving another, giving to another, and how deeply you really let someone into your life. That can be played out so much in sex. It's Sex is kind of, you know, the canary in the coal mine often. It's often showing sort of where the, the couple's operating in, in the way that they are intimate or not intimate. If you're in that situation where you are lonely through sex or like, how do you bring up that conversation? How do you start working from wherever you are to get to the next rung up the ladder, so to speak, to, to improve? Yeah. Intimacy? Well, I think the mistake that people make all the time is that they tend to approach that frustration from a place of what my partner is doing wrong, uh, like how my partner is functioning undesirably or that my partner doesn't desire me enough. Because I mean, in our defense, we're very aware of our spouse's limitations. It's easy to see them. But the way that most people approach those conversations is from a place of complaint. And on some level it's justified because they do see something that's actually true and they're calling attention to it but it doesn't tend to be productive because usually you get countered with everything your spouse knows about you and your problems that you're contributing to the limited sexual relationship. And you don't but, want to hear about your own problems. No, no. <laughs> I, I always prefer to talk about my husband's contributions to anything <laughs> over my own. So, you know, no, but if you, you know, I mean, I think to answer your question, the first thing I would say is, beginning to talk about it is just important in and of itself. A lot of us just kind of avoid the topic because we're afraid of it. A lot of us just kind of hope the other person hasn't really noticed or that it's maybe good enough because our own insecurity can come up pretty quickly around sexuality. And so, because it's pretty intimate behavior. And so just the issues of like, you know, who are we and is my spouse satisfied and who am I and what do they think of me? But just beginning to have the conversation. And then to my earlier point, to not talk about it in terms of what you think your spouse is doing wrong, but to talk about it in terms of maybe what you observe about yourself, possibly what you observe about your spouse, but what you maybe wish were different or you wish that the two of you could address. Because good sex is a team sport. You know, good sex is about two people really being willing to collaborate and to consider and think about, you know, what what do we think of our sexual relationship and where we'd, we'd like it to be and what's getting in the way of it. But it's done not to um, rid yourself of responsibility, but to, you know, be honest and really look at what's there and look at what you might want to do better or differently. Seems like it takes a lot of courage then. Uh, it does, exactly. And that's why a lot of people prefer resenting the bad sex they're having <laughs> than to actually be more intimate, really, expose their own heart, expose their own desires, expose their own limitations, and really have a more, you know, open hearted conversation to step in a direction that they may not fully understand or even really know. It's like a lot of times people have more of a feeling of a hunger for something deeper and richer, but they don't really know how to get there. And sometimes they're afraid that even in the process of trying to get somewhere a little better, they might ruin what they already have. And so I think, you know, especially if you've grown up in a faith tradition that has, you know, communicated some anxiety about sex, as sex is a kind of dangerous territory, well, then you can really fear that, that even touching it or addressing it, that you could get your hands dirty in some way and, and not be able to kind of get it back to where it was. And so I think it takes courage and I think it takes some confidence. I, th I think sometimes when we, give the message that sexuality is stronger than we are. We do ourselves a really deep disservice because we have to trust that our morality and our inner compass is stronger than our sexuality. That is that we will be the choosers and the deciders in navigating and creating that not every impulse or thought or idea we have will run us, that, but that instead we will think about what it is we wanna create with our spouse what, what we want to create with our sexuality in our relationship with our spouse. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm in one of your classes and you talked about this concept of three stages of sex and it had a profound influence over the way I think about sex. I used to think it was more transactional or about pleasure and connection too, but you've painted this beautiful picture of how much more sex can be in a marriage. Can you talk on that, please? Sure. I was borrowing um, David Data's idea where he talks about three stages of sex. And the first stage is where it's very solipsistic, very kind of self-referencing. It's really for your own pleasure. If you think about a, a young child, the way they might respond to their own genital pleasure if they're playing in the bathtub or something. This is you know, that the sex is about getting that physical pleasure and orgasm. And it's not really about relationship, even if you're doing this in partnered sex. And so, somewhat surprisingly for me, but the more I really look at what many couples are doing, a lot of people are in stage one, even though they've been married 20 years. It's, it's not really, it's about getting what they want. Their spouse is their only legitimate option kind of. And so they are, are getting their physical pleasure and of course the spouse in that especially if that other is the lower desire person will feel a lot of resentment about that because they just feel like they're literally being used for the other person to have an orgasm or have physical pleasure the second stage is more relational it's um because it's it's more an acknowledgement of the couple dynamic but it's a little more transactional or tit for tat kind of thing like i'll scratch uh, your back if you scratch mine you know kind of orgasm exchange and so there's acknowledgement of the other person's pleasure and you may even have good physical pleasure in stage two sex it's not the absence of pleasure but it's it's not really deeply collaborative it's not high meaning it's not um really focused on sort of cherishing loving you know opening up your heart that's stage three, where stage three is where, you know, in the Art of Loving course that you've been in, um, you know, I talk a lot about in the beginning, this is a course for men, and I talk a lot about how you are in relationship to yourself will deeply impact how you're in relationship to your spouse and your sexuality. And when you're still trying to work out your relationship to yourself, you're going to be in stage one or stage two in your sexuality on some level, right? I mean, this is not just like, you know, this is a continuum, but, but right, the more you are at peace with who you are, the more comfortable you are with you and you don't need to use the issues of sex and desire to prove something about yourself to yourself, the more you're really freed up to really love through your sexuality because you're at peace with it. You don't have to legitimize it and prove it's okay and prove you're okay. You're okay with yourself. And so you're free to be known and to really love and know your spouse. And so you're not trying to prove something. And so you can be, you know, I talk a little bit about masculine sexual energy is ultimately a, in its highest form, I think is a very generous, nurturing kind of sexual energy that, you know, men who talk about sexuality as a transcendent experience are often talking about the profound pleasure of really offering their spouse joy, like bringing her into bliss and being received on that level, that she's willing to be that open, to let her sexuality be that knowable, to be that free within herself, right? And to, to let herself be profoundly given to, right? And so there's a real beauty in that there is a real collaboration. It's that yin and yang, and it's really, you know, profoundly um, intimate, uh, profoundly transcendent for a lot of people. So I think in that stage three, there's a, it's this communication through one's sexuality, a communication of love, valuing, cherishing, beauty, celebration, celebration of life, a celebration of love, a, a, an acknowledgement that life is short. I mean, I don't know why that's so connected to sex and stage three sex, but I think it really is, is kind of that you don't take anything for granted. The presence of this wonderful person in your life is a gift and a kind of cherishing of that beauty and also that impermanence at the same time. It, those two seem very linked. And so 
Um, so yeah, and I think that, that that's what I think stage three sex is. And I think a lot of times people think, well, whatever they experienced at 20 was the height of their sexual relationship because that's when their body was the most responsive sexually. That's true for men. Um, women, it's a little bit later, but nonetheless, a lot of times people think that's the peak. And I think the more and more capable you become in loving and self-accepting and being able to really value and cherish and give to another, the richer that and better that sex gets. And so, you know, no, no 20 year old's heart can compare to the heart of a 60 year old. <laughs> and so uh, if you've gone through that developmental process. Mm -hmm. Any stories you can share of someone that was at maybe stage one, what obstacles they had to overcome and how they got to stage three? Like, what does that look like for the rest of us? I think, I mean, there's, I could probably tell you people that go from stage one to two and two to three. Um, yeah more than I know of anybody who's done one to three, at least while they're working with me. But, you know, I think, well, actually maybe a little bit. Um, you know, just one couple that comes to mind. It was just so much about, he was very stage one. It was very much about, you know, he'd grown up in a conservative faith tradition and sort of like his wife was his only legitimate way to orgasm. And I think they both kind of related to it that way. Very stage one, which is I have needs. Okay. Little side note for guys, never say that <laughs> because as soon as you put it, it in that meaning frame, you know, you have now made it clear that your spouse is supposed to service those needs. Right. And so it takes it out of the realm of passion and collaboration and partnership. That's and really unsexy. Like, don't mean to interrupt, but people download yeah. the app and they'll write in and say, I got this. So I, this is the wife, usually the lower right. desire spouse saying, yeah. I got this app so I can help my husband with his needs. Right. And I'm exactly. like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so that's definitely stage one sex, which is you, you know, and I better, I better provide that need or he's going to go look at porn or have an affair, you know, or whatever it is. And so it's this kind of production of physical pleasure which says so little about men if if that's you know how that men need somebody to that they can't control themselves at that level you think about how deeply untrustworthy that makes a man if that's in fact true but that would be stage one so this couple that came in you know he definitely was operating from that frame and in the course of our work together i mean he started to really confront how much he was using through his sexuality and there was a kind of entitlement in it that he was becoming increasingly aware of and uncomfortable with. And not only was it going from stage one to stage two in their sexual relationship, it was going from stage one to stage two in their emotional relationship where he recognized he really wasn't making room for her to have a life, making room for her to thrive, making room for her to not just be there to kind of back up his show and his life. And so, um, you know, so that's, so, so that, that's a couple, I mean, I think they started to flirt with some stage three things, but they, I, you know, I haven't seen them get there yet, but that started to happen, especially as there was deeper appreciation for the changes that he was making, deeper acknowledgement of the way they were both feeling better about themselves and stronger in the relationship, that, that the sex wasn't just about, okay, now I'm making more room for her orgasm, making more room for her pleasure. There was also moments of much deeper connection. I've worked with couples that go from that kind of a relationship to stage three, two to three, where they're doing more, um, some of the things I teach in my online courses are around activities that help people to better self-regulate when they're with their spouse and learn how to really find a kind of um, communion, for lack of a better word, when they're just hugging their spouse or touching their spouse, that they start ex learning the language of sexuality and sensuality and learning how to become more communicative in it. So they're learning not just how to make room for another person, but how to actually cherish another person and communicate that cherishing through their touch, through the way. So you know, I was just working with a couple yesterday. I mean, actually, I'm just pulling this couple into my head. They're definitely a couple that went from one to two. They're now 
really in two and he's really kind of stretching to understand what three even means which is how would i make love to my wife without having intercourse like that doesn't make any sense to me you know and i'm saying well because he was talking about when she's having her period and it interferes well it's a way of the way you touch her it's can you could you you know make love to the nape of her neck you know <laughs> by just the way you touch her body touch her back touch her hair is a kind of cherishing of the beautiful woman that's in your life that's been willing to grow confront herself change and evolve in meaningful ways and that you're grateful for it you're humbled by it that's all true for him and can you hold on to that and communicate that to her hold on to yourself enough and not be like am i going to get the sex i want is this going to turn into you know or not and let go of that and stabilize yourself enough to really just cherish her whether or not this leads to intercourse and orgasm and you know that for people can feel scary because it feels like well maybe if i start doing that you know i won't have my manipulative agenda operating and <laughs> i won't get the sex i want rather than they are making themselves so much more desirable to be with and to open up to so much safer for lack of a better word so much a better choice because this person is somebody who really values you cares about the entirety of you not just having sex with you and you're really learning this ability to love deeply through sexuality and you know um and, and so i think when people start to learn that like sex becomes highly desirable because who doesn't want to be touched like they're the most beautiful person in the world <laughs> and, yeah. and who doesn't want to be touched in a way that's a communication of love and valuing people that resist touch they feel like they're getting taken from to fulfill the needs of the other person and that's why they're they they're resisting it usually often for good reasons and then the flip side of that is now you're touching to give not to take that's right to bless not to that's right. hurt and that's right it becomes a beautiful thing it seems like there's a lot of risk going if you're a level 1 to level 2 or from yeah. a 2 to a 3 yeah. Uh, because yeah. now you're giving up your agenda. You're That's giving right. up what you've always wanted to make them be, and you have to let go. That's right. And that's scary for a lot of people. Absolutely. It takes courage to let go of our fantasy of control over other people. It's always ultimately a fantasy because really when it comes down to it, we don't control each other uh, <laughs> even as much as we might try. We're but good at making it, each other miserable though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Miserable in the effort to do it. And I think that what takes really a lot of courage is to, you know, a lot of people talk to me about, I want my spouse to choose me. I want to feel chosen. I want to be wanted. I want that passion. And I know, I believe that they do want it, but they want it without the risk of really letting somebody have a choice of really you know, addressing how choosable they are, how desirable they are, and really letting the other person assert that choice. They want to manipulate it, pressure it, get it. And so what's often happening in these, you know, stage one to stage two or stage two to three, you're giving up this kind of self-centered control and allowing more room for another person and allowing that person to really be a chooser, be their own self, not be some reinforcement of you. And that takes courage that you can sustain yourself, that you can be okay, even if someone doesn't give you what you want or choose what you want. You know, it's, it's an interesting for me and working with people like how much panic they feel about the fact that they can't make their spouse love them or choose them. And I, I'm not trivializing it. That is a hard thing that somebody can matter so much to you and you can't guarantee their love. But that's part of what is so beautiful about romantic love is the fact that it's chosen. And so we want it, but we're terrified to really tolerate the risk of not getting it. But when we won't tolerate that, we actually destroy any chance of ever having it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty profound. It reminds me of a conversation I had with a friend. They've, he and his wife have been married many years. And he's realized that for him, sex is a way for him to feel good about himself. It was when he has any anxiety about life or stress, he yeah. always wanted his wife to soothe him through sex. Yeah. And 
no wonder why she was never very sexual to him because because yeah. she's being probably feeling used and yeah. then now he's trying to make that decision how am i going to live because now he's got to give up wanting yeah. sex to soothe himself and that's a right. really difficult thing that's and then right. letting his wife choose and she may never choose to want him and that's, that's right. a really risky thing for him that's right and you know what he's what he's choosing is that is it it's a basic morality in it i mean it's like our own conscience will push on us because it's like look i can't you my wife can't be my stress ball you know it's not really fair to do that to another human being to pressure her in that way but to really step into my own and learn to self-regulate it takes a lot of anxiety tolerance especially because when you're doing it you're not very good at doing it yet and every cell in your body wants to go into the old pattern and you're trying to break the pattern meanwhile your spouse may have just to speak from that example her own um anxiety about not being needed right and might even be pressuring to keep it at this sort of stage one or stage two level rather than a place where she might really be up against a choice that she'd prefer to hide from than to really make so whenever couples break those dynamics it usually puts both parties in a higher anxiety, higher choice-based position that invariably takes courage. But I don't know anybody who grows without being courageous. I mean, that is the cost of growth. Mm -hmm. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about ravishing. Mm. Whenever I heard about ravishing, I think about like pillaging, taking- <laughs> Yeah, that's like, true. Or like the caveman running yeah. with like the wife on his shoulder running out of the village, whatever. Yeah. But that's not what you mean. It's like no. whole bodied cherishing or wholehearted right. loving. That's so interesting because we have a lot of those words because I think of our ambivalence about sex. There's a lot of words like that that have their technical meaning is much more neutral. Like the word lust, for example, that's embodied desire. But at least in our religious tradition, lust is usually meant to be about selfishness, selfish sexuality, right? And so ravishing is probably one of those words and I hadn't really thought about it like that. And erotic is another one of those words. Yes, too. erotic is definitely one of those words too, that it's sort of like, you know, erotic is, 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 is bad sexuality. So, um, but ravishing, yeah, ravishing is... That's stage three, isn't it? That's so stage three. And it's a most amazing thing. Cause you know, I mean, the stage three masculine or yang position is to be able to really give, right? And cherish and that, I mean, it's always dual, you know, it's not just one way ever, but the other strong side of that is the more yin position, which is to be able to receive someone, to be able to surrender in a way to that pleasure. And I don't mean like you're losing yourself, but you are solid enough of a person that you can surrender to that pleasure without losing your sense of your own self and strength. So that's the kind of yin yang beauty of that um, kind of sexuality and, and um, people can step into different positions in that. But but now I forgot what your question was. Oh, the cherishing. Oh yeah. So, and so this, it's like stage three. That illustrate what ravishing yes. looks like. So it does take both this ability to be able to cherish through your sexuality, through your sensuality. It's the way you touch the shoulder. It's the way you kiss the inner thigh. It's the way you, you know, touch your spouse's hair and face. You know, there's a, sometimes like this kind of like grabbing of, of a face, which is sort of like, there's a kind of, mitigated aggression in it but it's not an aggression that's antisocial. it's a kind of like embodied desire and valuing that's highly positive right and so but it's both being able to cherish on that level and have it be communicated through your sexuality and to be able to receive it and not push it away and a lot of people are afraid to receive they're afraid that their sense of self isn't worthy of that kind of valuing they're afraid to let somebody have that much impact on them they're afraid to admit through receiving that someone really, really matters to them or that they could actually benefit from somebody else's strength. A lot of us want to be in this kind of anti-dependency position that's a kind of false strength. 
because really strong people can let other people bless their life and really let other people have an impact um, without feeling that they're less for it but to be able to receive it, let the, bless their lives and they can bless in return, bless other people, bless those who've blessed them. So, um, so ravishing is where it's at, yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I want to talk also about uh, erotic and eros energy. Mm. That's something you've changed my mind on. I used to think mm. erotic was a bad word. Mm -hmm. Now I'm learning more that it's about tapping into this deep source of like zest for life yeah and living through your being yeah how does that play out in a romantic relationship and how can you cultivate more of that so eros energy is as you're saying dan is like this um it's it's in this sort of life force energy and, you know, when you, if you think about when you fell in love, that's you're flooded with Eros energy. It's like the sky is bluer, you know, everything around you, is, the sun is brighter, everything's funnier. You know, I can remember when I was falling in love with John and I just kept walking around my apartment laughing and my roommate was like, you're weird. You know, I, <laughs> Your Twitter page. Everything was amazing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so, so that's eros energy but you also feel eros energy whenever you're doing anything that's expansive doing things with your through your physicality climbing a mountain you're going to feel high eros energy when you're at the top and you're looking out at the beauty and, and what you've accomplished um so it's anything that sort of expands your soul expands your sense of the world and it's what makes us feel alive and energized and joyful and Thanatos energy is the opposite. It's like the reclusive, it's the turning in, it's shutting people out, it's snuggling up, you know, into a blanket and, and kind of, and that's more the death instinct, right? So one of the, you know, some people think erotic exists for sex, but it's a, another way of saying it is sex exists for the erotic. That is that sexuality is a way of tapping into this Eros energy that is so life-giving and so vital for being happy and joyful and alive. And so sex is one very important way to do it. And it's a very important way to do it in a marriage. You know, you know, a lot of people talk about when their sexual relationship starts expanding and growing, they just become so much happier as a couple. They just become like, you know, this person's the most amazing person. I'm so grateful I married them. And, uh, you know, and, and that's because they are expanding themselves in the context of the marriage and sexuality is such a valuable way to do it. And so a lot of people think about sex as, oh, it's about getting to the orgasm, right? That's stage one or stage two, rather than sex is a way to play in the erotic, to play in the eros energy. Tantric traditions are about keeping that period of, of when you're in that eros energy, your ability to see and know is at a heightened state. You can know and value and, and recognize your spouse as an independent, separate person from you with their own interests and desires. And so on. You can see it and understand it better when you're in that Eros energy. You can, you know, so it's a, when couples play and stay in that energy, it's deeply uniting. It deeply expands the intimacy. It expands the marriage. And so in tantric traditions, it's like delay orgasm because it teaches you to be a better lover, quite literally. It teaches you to know more deeply. It allows you to be able to handle more Eros energy within your own body and within your marriage. So it's, you know, we're so afraid of sexuality because I think we're afraid of the hedonism in it, that the orgasm and so, the selfishness that's often in it for many people. I don't want to deny that that's not in fact true. People that are in a stage one sexual relationship, uh, if you're on the receiving side of that, it's not pleasant and pleasurable. And they're like, I don't know what she's talking about, about all this beauty and stuff, right? <laughs> and so they're absolutely right. You know, if sex is ever exploitative, it can be very, dis very destructive. So, um, but, um, but I feel like I just lost where I was going here, let me see. So, I can't think of what I was just saying. I just lost where I was going. But anyway, so I think that, you know, you can really, the more you can create this creativity and expansiveness, the happier, happier you'll be. You know, couples that are the happiest married 
talk about that in the context of marriage, they felt that their sense of self expanded, their sense of who they were became larger. So the things they were able to do and create in the world through the sexual relationship, through the partnership, people who are the least happy have a marriage that constricts them, that they feel like they have to be within a box. They can only show a certain part of themselves. Their spouse can't handle knowing other parts of them. Those are the least happy people. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about in long-term relationships, that balance of the familiar and the new and the novelty and why we need that good, healthy balance so that we can get to stage three? Yeah. Well, Esther Perel talks about this quite a bit. And this is also a part of kind of family systems thinking and theory, uh, which is that we, we want two things in life, all of us, which is we want to belong to another person we want to belong to a family to a community it matters to us to know we have a place and and we want someone special that's the pair bonding instinct is a very human instinct and so we really want that but what i think sometimes we miss in in our cultural conversations about intimacy is that we also want to belong to our own identity we want to belong to our own sense of self so while we want to attach we also want a relationship with our own goals and dreams and desires. And so there is this duality that exists within human beings that we want the familiarity and stability of love and belonging, but we want the expansion of belonging to our own dreams, goals, ambitions, and it's stretching ourselves into something else. And so when we think about a good romantic relationship, we always imagine ourselves having both. I'm going to do all these things that matter to me and he's just going to adore me every step of the way. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and he's just going to be there backing me up hundred percent. You know, that's, that's the romantic fantasy, which never works out because they have their dreams. And sometimes their dreams are in contradiction with your dreams. And, and that pushes couples into a meaningful conflict, which, you know, I talk about a lot in my courses and I won't spend more time on right now, but I think that, that um, we want both in our sexual relationships too people that just go from novel experience to novel experience, you know, they may find it easy to orgasm as soon as they run up upon a, new, a novel experience because we like novelty, but you have no meaning, you have no depth, you have no, you know, anyone who really knows you. And so it's deeply lonely, even if it's exciting for a little bit. But on the other hand, if you have something that's very familiar very stable, very certain, well, then there's no expansion. And, you know, um, if it's so predictable and you've kind of reduced each other to something really predictable, in some ways it's not even true because you've kind of shut out all the novelty that you don't want to deal with, but a false stability like that feels very lonely and very limited. And so it will also be low in meaning and low in, in um, happiness. So sexual relationships and love relationships need this, this tension between the familiar and the knowing and being known, but also the ability to allow each other to grow and expand and to introduce novelty, not a novelty that destroys the safety of the marriage, but a novelty that expands the marriage and expands how deeply you can know the other person. A lot of times when you know, a spouse tells you something that they've always wanted or that they've thought of or that they like, you know, at first you might be like, well, you know, but it's, and on the other hand, it's like, oh, you actually now have a new possibility, something you could try together. It's also knowing your spouse and knowing what they think about and what matters to them and what that says about who they are. And, you know, it takes some courage. It takes some courage to be able to walk towards those things and to think about them and to create something that you can both enjoy and create something that you can both be partnered in. But that is a necessary and meaningful process. And sometimes people, I teach the Art of Desire course to women. I do a lot of these workshops. And sometimes women will say, like, it's just gotten so boring. I don't know how to make it more interesting. And sometimes I say, go home and tell your husband something you've never dared to tell him before that you might like to try. And that will spice it up like that. <laughs> I mean, he may be like, I don't want to do it. You know, it's possible. But at least you're, it's more intimate. You're showing more of your mind. You're showing more of who you are. And it is often, you know, this sort of unwelcome, exciting 
moment. That's <laughs> all, great. All at once. That's fantastic. Or there's an app for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's an app for that. Exactly. Uh, can you uh, close us out with talking about um, just sex is more than just the technique and the mechanical. It could be really good, like a great violinist, but to be a really good musician, you need heart. Yeah. Tell the story exactly. about the concert yeah. where the power went out. I love that story. Oh yeah. And right. It to, to level three, stage three lovemaking. Yeah. So my sister was, who's a musician was telling me, she's a violin teacher about one of her uh, professional peers came up to perform um, here in Vermont in the theater with the, they were going to play the Brahms and the orchestra was going to be behind and was a violin concerto and there was an ice storm and the power went out and so the orchestra couldn't play and so people were going to just leave but um, he came up and said listen I can play the Bach Chacon, um in the dark because I know it well enough and so my sister said it was the most remarkable experience. I mean, the Chacon in and of itself is a, 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 a it's a box composition after his wife died. And so it is a, a piece that is a, a kind of raw grief in having lost his love of his life. And it's a beautiful piece because it's Bach and Bach is so remarkable. But, um, but she said, sitting in that audience with all the other sensation and to feel him play. And she'd heard this piece many, many times, right? But the heart that was in that, the way he played it, the way he nurtured the audience, he had tremendous skill, but it's not just skill. You know, you can be a stage two lover and have skill, but to be a stage three lover, you have to have skill and heart. You have to be able to communicate your heart to another. And it's the sharing of beauty. Like when I listen to really remarkable musicians like that, I feel deep gratitude because they've offered me beauty for all their hard work, but then daring up, daring to show up and to freshly perform something they've played a million times and bring their heart, bring a fresh offering to the group. And it's just a, we can do that through love and sex to touch our spouse both with all the familiarity of having known them for 25 years and also with touching them like they are, don't belong to you, that they are this remarkable person in your life and touching them like, you know, cherishing them for just the, the very fact of their presence and how much you still don't know about them, right? Not because they're hiding things, but because we're infinite creatures. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. If people want to reach out to you, get to know you better, take your courses, how can they find out about you? Just go to my website, which is my last name. So that's finlayson fifecom And on there, you'll find my podcast archive. I have five online courses, um, two for couples, one for men, one for women, and then one for parents, all about how to increase um, the both emotional and sexual intimacy in your relationships but also how to create a more stable, joyful relationship with yourself, which is really at the core of so much of it. So yeah, that's all on my website. And, and, um, and then, you know, I have Instagram and Facebook and all those things, but you can find your way to all those things uh, through my website. Yeah. <laughs> that's excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.